All right, it's uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Let's go ahead and start this broadcast. Again, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm GP with Stack Armor. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our first uh, webinar in 2022, 2022. And I hope everybody had a safe and happy new year. And we certainly here at Stack Armor, along with uh, our colleagues from Amazon Web Services are really excited about 2022 and looking forward to what's ahead. So again, I'm GP, I'm the principal here at Stack Armor. My background is in helping customers, particularly in the federal and DOD space, uh, modernize and migrate their applications and systems to hyperscale cloud services like Amazon uh, AWS. Um, I've done that for almost at this point, uh, 13 years. Uh, did my first migration in 2009 with a White House system called recovery.gov. Um, had the privilege of winning a few awards along the way. Um, I was a Fed 100 as well as um, Rising Star uh, awardee. So I appreciate the recognition from our peers. Um, I also have a star cast of speakers with me my colleague and partner, Martin Rieger, who's our chief solutions officer. Uh, we've been privileged to have him lead our ATU and compliance practice. Uh, Martin, would love to have you introduce yourself uh, to our uh, listeners uh, tuning in. Thank you, GP. Um, yeah, so um, in addition to uh, leading the compliance teams um, and developing packages. I, I come from a uh, Navy background in addition to the 3PAO world being third-party assessment organizations for FedRAMP uh, in both the advisory and uh, assessment sides of the house there uh, going, going back roughly 10 years since the beginning. Um, had the great privilege of working with a lot of companies and a lot of uh, agencies as well. Uh, so I am looking forward to talking with you all today um, about how uh, we've applied all of that knowledge and experience gained over the last decade uh, into a faster solution for you to achieve ATOs. Thank you, Martin. Looking forward to that conversation. Just a little quick uh, uh, snippet about Stack Armor. We are an advanced um, AWS security and compliance partner. We've had the privilege of working with some of the finest uh, team members within the AWS ecosystem, again, specialize in helping move um, and secure regulated workloads on AWS. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome uh, my colleague from Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Services, Greg Herman. I'll probably not do justice to his background and his role, but uh, welcome, Greg. Happy New Year, and would love to have the audience um, get your introduction. Sure. Thanks, GP. And hello, everyone. My name is Greg Herman. I'm a senior security partner strategist working on the ATO on AWS program, which I'm going to dive into here in just a sec. Been with AWS approximately five and a half years. Um, I previously supported or actually managed FedRAMP and DoD assessments for AWS services. Prior to that, I've worked in the security and compliance field. Um, she's going on almost 15 years now, um, supporting both public sector um, as well as uh, commercial sector regulated industries. Great, uh, Greg. Thank you very much for that introductions and uh, introduction, and you know, welcome. And again, thank you for being here with us. Uh, Martin, if you wouldn't mind be being our virtual driver and driving us to the next slide. Awesome, thank you. So we have a pretty packed agenda, so let's go and get started. We have about 60 minutes for this broadcast. And so just some of the topics we'll be covering in today's uh, webinar. Um, we wanna talk to you about FedRAMP, uh, the FedRAMP uh, Cloud Security and Compliance Program that allows commercial services organizations to provide cloud services to federal and DOD agencies. What are some of the trends we are seeing? Uh, what are some of the roadblocks we commonly see for organizations that are pursuing FedRAMP? Uh, we will also be introducing to you a interesting program we launched uh, with, along with our partners here at Amazon Web Services, along with uh, Splunk and Talos, uh, specifically for really streamlining and making it easy 
or easier, I should say, to go in and obtain uh, a FedRAMP ATO. We'll be just covering a lot of topics in and around FedRAMP, um, how to streamline that process. And again, some of the interesting partnerships we've assembled to make it um, relatively uh, streamlined to achieve these objectives. So I will at this point hand it over to my colleague, uh, Greg, to walk you through a really interesting and in my mind, unique program that's specifically designed for ATOs and compliance for regulated workloads. Greg, over to you, sir. Thanks, JP and uh, GP, excuse me, and hello, everyone. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to give a quick overview of the ATO and AWS program and how it supports AWS customers today. So back in early 2018, we recognized that customers were really struggling to meet their security and compliance requirements in the cloud. Uh, the security capabilities were definitely there. It's just many customers were struggling to translate those on-prem or local requirements, you know, hardware requirements and controls into technical capabilities in the cloud. And this includes ensuring they had identified all the technical services and applications um, they needed to configure and um, install or update to meet those obligations. So prior to the launch of the program, admittedly, we had more of an ad hoc approach on, on how we supported customers in that regard, um, attending meetings, one-off meetings here and there, trying to help customers, you know, as questions rolled in. It was uh, much more reactionary at the time. And the sheer volume of customers seeking that support quickly overwhelmed us. And so... <clears throat> we ultimately recognized that, you know, we had many expert partners that could provide direct support to our customers and help them meet this sort of overwhelming demand that we were facing. So in June of 2019, we ultimately launched um, what we affectionately call today the ATO on AWS program. And it has the uh, primary goal of supporting and accelerating AWS customers' abilities to meet their security, regulatory, and compliance requirements on AWS. And we do have an application process whereby partners must submit them online. They, this requires them to go through a review, demonstrate past performance of supporting you know, customers on AWS in this regard. And, and we, just, we do this to ensure that any partners that join our program and maintain membership in our program are in fact experts in their field. That way we, as AWS um, employees, feel confident when we make recommendations to our customers to work with given partners. Now, since our launch, Stack Armor has been uh, one of those partners I regularly recommend to our customers um, that are seeking public sector authorizations or certifications. They were uh, one of our original launch partners. They not only helped conceptualize the program, but uh, help ensure its successful launch. And they've been a staunch supporter of the program ever since. So not only is Stack Armor obviously experts in their field, but they've proactively worked with other ATO and AWS and even, even other AWS partners, uh, such as Red Hat, Telos, Splunk, to name a few, to develop automated tooling that can really help customers meet their security and compliance obligations and do so at an accelerated rate. And it's with that, uh, which Stack Armor will be diving deep with you on today. And so I'll hand it back over to GP and Martin so they can dive uh, pretty deep on their faster program. Again, thanks GP and Martin, appreciate the time. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much for sharing um, an overview of the ATO and AWS program, certainly a unique initiative. And again, it's been a privilege to be a part uh, of that program since its inception. So I want to sort of switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, the past year and really look forward to what it means in terms of really the significant market opportunity that we see in the area of commercial cloud services that federal and other government agencies are buying. One of the very interesting trends we see is not only are excuse me, federal agencies buying cloud services, but we are increasingly seeing a number of state and local agencies go in and visit the FedRAMP.gov marketplace and only select services that are FedRAMP accredited. So again, 
we feel that the, the market as uh, shown here by these numbers is uh, again, growing pretty fast. And so again, for commercial organizations that have interesting cloud solutions, I think the federal market is a great place to explore significant growth in the years to come. So for example, Dell Tech's market research report published last year showed that almost $4.2 billion were spent on just FedRAMP accredited cloud services and the overall federal cloud market is expected to grow uh, by 11 point, to almost $11.4 billion by 2023. Again, pretty significant market opportunity that continues to grow. Equally interesting is some data from the FedRAMP uh, program management office that shows along with an incre the increase uh, in demand is more and more cloud services are being accredited and therefore available in the marketplace. I think, you know, by last count, it's over 250 authorized cloud services. And simultaneously on the right-hand side, as this graphic shows, there is the increase in reuse. Bottom line, the market is growing significantly, both in terms of availability of solutions, as well as the consumption of those solutions as shown by some of these graphics. Again, for commercial organizations that are interested and have awesome SaaS or other ISV uh, solutions that are applicable to a regulated market, we see a significant growth. And I think the, the story around FedRAMP has just begun. And so again, as you are looking at uh, growth opportunities for 2022 and beyond, uh, again, would encourage you to look at the FedRAMP process and how you might be able to create an offering in this highly differentiated space. So let's take a look at some other trends. Um, again, one of the things we find a lot is questions around uh, you know, our ATO strategy, right? And so one big uh, challenge a lot of cloud service providers have or a question they have is, hey, you know, how do we go about getting an ATO? And so within that context, um, there are you know, what we call different ATO, ATO pathways. And so again, what the first graphic shows you is, uh, you know, the one pathway is the JAB, uh, which is the Joint uh, Authorization Board uh, that uh, pr pr provides an, an ATO. And then you have sort of what we call the agency sponsorship route. So what these numbers are showing is based on the data from the fedram.gov marketplace, it's interesting is almost 62% of the ATOs uh, by the JAB were around uh, infrastructure as a service, while 88% were for uh, you know, for SaaS. So depending on your solution, whether it's IES or SaaS, your ATO strategy needs to adapt to that. And so again, we do a lot of advisory and assistance to help you pick the right path. The second thing that's also very interesting is to take a look at the data and see, hey, who is buying cloud services? So again, the FedRAM.gov marketplace provides some interesting insights and data. So on the left, you see some of the top cloud buyers that are agencies that are leveraging FedRAMP accredited cloud services and are basically consuming those. And so here you see some of the top 10 agencies that are buying cloud services. On the right hand side, you see the top 10 agencies that are willing to sponsor cloud services. So again, if uh, you're a cloud service provider, and you're trying to figure out, you know, where should you go in and market your service, then obviously you want to know who are the agencies that are buying cloud services and, and are, uh, and hence, more inclined and familiar with the FedRAMP process. And then on the other side, if you're looking to obtain a sponsor, then it's interesting to note who are the agencies that understand the sponsorship process and have been sponsoring. So again, we help commercial organizations um, not just apply the technology, but also help them with some of this uh, market information to enable them to make the right decisions. Um, an interesting tidbit of information as an example is, you know, Department of Education that this highlights here is obviously in the top 10 list of cloud buyers, but they're not in the top 10 list of sponsors. So for example, if you were 
a commercial organization looking for a sponsor, maybe Department of Education is not a good area for you to go uh, just because you know they uh, are, are not known to sponsor uh, agencies based on what the data shows. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Department of Commerce, uh, they are both not only a top cloud uh, services buyer, but they're also uh, in the top 10 for sponsors. So again, your strategy for sponsorship can be helped by some of this data. And again, that's a key part of the value that we at Stack Armor bring uh, to commercial organizations that are looking for an ATO is we don't just come in and say, okay, you know, use certain set of cloud services or, you know, uh, uh, here, here is a package, but we do a little bit more uh, deep analysis to make sure that you're making the right decisions and we are able to give you the right guidance to be successful in this marketplace. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you and share my perspectives on the market and some of the trends. I will at this point request my colleague Martin to talk to you a little bit about what are some of the common roadblocks and challenges and pitfalls we find commercial organizations face. And so again, our offering is designed to help address these issues up front so that ultimately you can be successful in your FedRAMP ATO journey. With that, Martin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, GP. Um, yeah, so when, when we talk about common roadblocks and, and we talk about the last 10 years, right, of, of FedRAMP, um, which the program has matured uh, greatly over the years, especially during uh, what I would say is, is the first four. Um, but that being said, you know, within Amazon, uh, there are basically uh, two options, right, from an ETO perspective. There is the public cloud environment, which is the AWS East-West regions. And then there is a government community cloud environment and understanding the differences between those two um, and the implications of, okay, if, if, if I need to sell to everybody, right? And it, meaning my existing commercial customers and, and the public environment, but I also wanna to sell to the government, well then that public cloud is the option. But if there are, agency requirements in many cases that don't allow for that and say they want a government only community cloud, in which case um, then you would need to choose that uh, Amazon uh, set of infrastructure components and services. So that's really kind of one of the first distinctions because it leads us down the other paths and the other options such as uh, risk categorization, right? Um, moderates available from a risk level uh, in both the public and gov cloud environments. However, high and for instance, the DOD baseline of FedRAMP, um, which includes uh, what's known as an impact level four uh, exists in GovCloud. So understanding not just public or government, but also the risk categorizations is really another critical uh, aspect that not everybody kind of looks at upfront. Everybody's looking to say, okay, I wanna get FedRAMP. I want the most secure environment possible, but your business needs also need to be met. Um, encryption requirements are, in many cases, sometimes show-stopping items. We, we have a federal information processing standard known as 140-2. Uh, there is a level above this, but, but at the moment, 140-2 is the requirement. Uh, where encryption is being used? So, for example, um, data in motion, data at rest, uh, VPN, multi-factor technology, um, wherever encryption is being used, it's, it's got to meet that FIPS 140-2 uh, requirement. And so for some companies, especially if they have their own custom algorithms, their own custom modules, or even if they're leveraging someone else's, um, if that compliance certificate isn't there, it is a show-stopping item, right? Um, so let's say you know where you want to go. You've got your um, risk level established. There are a couple different paths you can go, including what is known as the Joint Authorization Board, which requires no sponsorship. Uh, but alternatively, we have an agency path, which does require sponsorship, which basically means the agency is your partner. Um, they are in it from uh, the initial go live all the way to decommissioning of the system, the, the, the full life cycle. Um, that agency is, is responsible for all of the risk in the, in the environment, whereas the JAB takes no risk at all. Um, they grant what's known as a uh, provisional ATO, which can then be 
taken by an agency, uh, put on their own letterhead, signed and authorized, and, and be used again and again and again. And that's really the foundation and purpose of FedRAMP, which is to assess once and use that ATO again and again um, without having to go back and re-audit. So you've selected your path. Uh, you're ready to get started. You know, the question is always, how many people is this going to take? You know, even with the assistance and the accelerators that we offer here uh, at Stack Armor, there are still things you have to do on your side of the house. There's your development teams, your engineering folks, um, project and program management, your business team, your human resources teams. So um, in terms of, of roadblocks, understanding that this is not just a documentation exercise. It's not a deploy, set it and forget it. It is a continuous ongoing, um, continuous monitoring environment that does require resources, even when you have accelerators in place. So, you know, kind of coming to the last couple items here, change control. Um, you've got an authorized service. How do you add new services later? Well, or even modify things, right? There's what's known as a significant change process. Uh, it has subcomponents and there are uh, the ability to add new services, new features, and you can change um, the baseline and the environment uh, by following the process FedRAMP has in place. And they, they do have forms and templates and uh, three PAOs, agencies, and the FedRAMP PMO, everybody's involved. Um, but there is a methodology, there is a process that does allow you to add new services and features and change the environment. Uh, so understanding that and knowing ahead of time, it, it, it doesn't have to be set completely in stone, um, but once authorized, uh, it does get a little more complicated. So second to last item here, the budgeting aspect of this. Um, it's not the same necessarily for everyone. You've probably seen some articles in the news about the millions some companies spend. Um, it's not always that drastic, right? Or, or even to that extent, uh, FedRAMP can be done efficiently, effectively, uh, and there are cost-saving metrics and mechanisms for this, um, which is what FASTER is designed to do, uh, which is really knock out a good portion of this budget by leveraging prefabbed uh, controls in addition to solutions that can be deployed rapidly, documented quickly, and get you to that ATO faster. Um, the last item here at the bottom, which is sponsorship, uh, I always tell folks, it's half the battle, folks, um, that without a sponsor, things are extremely difficult. But if, if you remember, the jab package, the jab path does not require a sponsor. So you do have a way to get there. But if the agency route is your goal, um, having their buy-in uh, and having them commit to sponsoring you um, really is half the battle. Uh, without that, it, it's really hard to move forward. You can assess, but then um, assessments grow stale, you know, after a period of time uh, and different components, roughly a year. But uh, aside from that, sponsorship is a critical piece. So what is faster, right? Um, ultimately, this is a AWS-led initiative uh, with the partners under the ATO and AWS program, meaning each of this, Amazon, Splunk, Stack Armor, and Telos, um, we all came together to put together a security and compliance um, solution that's not only all in one, but specifically designed for government. So a core portion of this is the Threat Alert ATO Accelerator. Um, the ATO Accelerator is deployed in Boundary uh, at, with platform as a code components behind it. So all of the auditing, logging, vulnerability scanning, uh, security architecture and security stack requirements um, are met through the Threat Alert GSS, which is then um, accompanied by the deployment of landing zones that are hardened and pre-configured and designed from the ground up to be compliant with NIST controls so that you can deploy your applications quickly. Uh, the last core piece of this is the Telos uh, Exacta 360 product, which is OSCAL ready. Um, for those that aren't familiar, OSCAL is a uh, machine language readable format of NIST controls that allows us to document um, in an OSCAL ready system and also export the FedRAMP package 
or push it to another OSCAL enabled environment such as GSA systems or health and human service systems. Um, these packages that, that we prepare uh, include controls that we provide and supply to you as audit ready controls. And it also supports your post ATO continuous monitoring activities. Um, there is, is one last core aspect to this, which is uh, ATO acceleration, right? And, and we do this in an agile manner. As I mentioned before, you've got uh, basically two options with Amazon. You can go east, west, or you can go GovCloud. So we begin with landing zones in whichever environment you choose. Uh, we follow that up by deploying um, the cloud security general support system, which is all of the security control tools needed to continuously monitor and maintain a FedRAMP environment. Um, everything is deployed in Boundary. And, and if you're not familiar with the term Boundary, we're talking about an accreditation boundary, which is really uh, an invisible line that we draw around the entire solution and the environments and scope for an audit. So from that perspective, to eliminate all kinds of issues with what we call external services, uh, external uh, systems, all of the tools that we're talking about that support the environment, they're deployed in your AWS uh, landing zones in your environment to avoid all of the headache and red tape and issues that come with out of boundary components. Next is hardening the system. So within your own environments, there is a requirement that you begin with CIS level one benchmarks. Uh, level two is, is traditionally where folks kind of end up, but level one is the bare minimum. Um, we talked about the FIPS 140-2 encryptions. For DoD customers, there are additional security technical guides that have to be put in place, plus other things like USGCB um, and OAuth top 10. Um, the last piece of this that, that we kind of also mentioned on the previous slide is that uh, Exacto 360 as, as a uh, just think GRC tool um, is how we really streamline all of this and what allows us to do all this much, much faster than we were before. Uh, in other words, not leveraging the Word docs and the Excel sheets and the different components that are uh, FedRAMP GSA templates and attachments. Um, having this in place supports both the preparation, but also the assessment and the continuous maintenance and monitoring afterwards. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to GP now to talk to you about the boundaries. Thank you, Martin. And so, you know, one of the things we find a lot is, uh, you know, again, we talked a little bit about how Martin described, you know, people talk about, uh, you know, FedRAM projects potentially costing, you know, millions of dollars or, you know, uh, uh, many, many months or, you know, if not years. Again, we've just found just based on experience and having done this for a long time, is there are certain key things that contribute to that complexity or delay. And so uh, we're just, we've just streamlined that process. And one of the key things is to make sure that the data that's gonna be hosted within the cloud system um, is protected in a manner that's that's, that's consistent with what a federal or DOD agency would expect. And the way we do that is to make sure that we go in and draw a fairly distinct boundary, which is essentially that red line that you see around uh, this diagram that represents the environment where data is stored. Uh, not only that, it's important to go in and architect that hosting environment in a manner such that we have what's called separation of concerns where security data, the operational data, and then the customer data are separated in a manner that we can protect them individually such that the system has defense in depth um, and cannot be compromised easily. All of these different aspects are already built into it. And so then we go in and essentially have that ready-made blueprint with which now we have, as you know, Martin described earlier, is an engineering approach to an ATO. A lot of times, a lot of organizations um, are supported by you know, auditors or you know, organizations that don't necessarily have that much of an engineering background. But again, 
uh, we have, uh, again, streamlined this process by moving a lot of this security and automation baked into the solution. So we're able to deliver a boundary. We're able to then go in and take a uh, engineering approach and you know what we call an agile pipeline approach. This is what you see here. So first, draw the boundary, deploy the security services, then go in and make the package ready in a manner that um, it streamlines that process. Again, OSCAL is something that you'll be hearing about uh, a lot in the next coming months. And so we are already ready for that. Uh, there are some other aspects around the use of um, NIST SP 800-53 Rev 5. So again, it becomes very important to be what I call you know, future ready. Um, once we have the environment stood up and the package done, we then get into essentially what we call assessment support where uh, we need to assist with uh, the performance of interviews uh, during the audit process by a third party assessor organization. Also uh, assisting in meetings with your sponsor agency as an example to provide evidentiary information, to provide explanations, and also potentially with the FedRAMP PMO uh, to be able to go in and answer any questions they might have. And again, be a part of your team to go in and make sure you're able to go in and articulate the responses in a manner that the um, auditor or the agency is looking for. And finally, once the ATO has been achieved, um, there are a set of uh, what we call 58 uh, FedRAM continuous monitoring controls that have to be adhered to. So we, again, as Stack Armor, provide managed services, managed security services, as well as compliance services to make sure that you know, your team has the necessary support um, and expertise to be able to um, not only obtain the ATO, but then of course, to maintain it. Uh, I, at this point, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Martin, to walk you through how all of these disparate pieces come together through the faster process. Thank you, GP. So basically there, there's three kind of core elements to this and, and the process um, really begins with, um, you know, the establishment and building of that in boundary landing zone, okay? So we've got our infrastructure services, we've got our platform components, and then there is the preparation of, of the customer SaaS environment, which could be production uh, or production plus uh, a dev and test environment as well. Um, so, in deploying customer environments, right, there is uh, what's known as inheritance. Um, one of the beauties, uh, I, I think, of the AWS environment that sometimes folks understand, but there are things that are sort of overlooked, is, is the ability to inherit, right? So when we talk about inheritance from a controls perspective or security controls, you know, you can leverage controls and you can inherit them. And so from a AWS perspective, everybody tends to think about the physical and environmental controls and the maintenance controls for those facilities and, and the media protection of the drives that exist within there. But there are other things too, um, such as contingency planning controls for uh, alternate availability zones, alternate regions, uh, the backup and recovery aspects. So um, that deployment is, is basically uh, in the infrastructure environment and leverage of those controls is followed by the tailoring uh, to a sense in the sense that um, when we tailor controls, um, that, that's another way of saying sometimes they're modified, enhanced, or we add uh, additional compensating controls to perhaps assist with things that maybe we can't fully execute every checklist. And, and sometimes that happens. But in order to do so, um, we, we do have options and we do have additional capabilities to make sure that you can achieve readiness, right? That you are prepared for an audit and ready to be tested and assessed. So this, this really, these first three steps um, are, are what comprise kind of that ATO machine or what we term Atom uh, in getting you ready to go. From an assessment standpoint, um, we don't just prepare you. We're here during the entire process, during the entire audit. Uh, our teams support the interviews, evidence and artifacts gathering, screenshots, exports, uh, whatever's needed during uh, the assessment process. The next step in that is authorization, right? So whether agency or JAB, 
right? During the review uh, of the package, in other words, the security assessment report, pen test report, scans, uh, the team is there every step of the way. This is followed by continuous monitoring, which um, really once you get your ATO, you are officially in a continuous monitoring state. Um, that last step here is if, if you are a package or a company that is looking to use the ATO again and again, going through the agency as step one, that ATO is an agency ATO, step two, or the final step is being listed in the FedRAMP marketplace so that that ATO can be pulled down again as a provisional and signed and authorized again and again and again. Um, throughout this process, you know, there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of implementation, there's the development of policies and procedures and plans. And so I don't want to ignore that. That's a continuous ongoing effort. But this is the process in order to achieve uh, FedRAMP ATOs. We do have uh, and support other uh, compliance frameworks such as FISMA, RMF, CMMC, uh, 800 or, or or what you might term DFARS and ITAR, depending on where you're going. Um, so, so this process is applied to all of them, not just FedRAMP. Um, I want to take a moment to talk about Exacta 360, which is a TELUS product. Um, they have basically established a, a tool that's specifically designed to automate the ATO process. This is where the documentation, the SSP, the other FedRAMP artifacts and attachments that we need are created, stored, and exchanged, uh, in addition to the, the workflow. So from an advisory perspective, each, each Exacta uh, server is a project that is stored in Boundary in the environment. Um, it belongs to the customers, and each control individually is managed and tracked. Um, they can also be mapped back to other frameworks, so not just FedRAMP. Uh, they have uh, APIs and plugins and capabilities that allow you to pull in AWS infrastructure data. So it's not just um, the management, monitoring, and maintenance of the security controls uh, and the SSP. Um, it also has a capability of pulling in from vulnerability scanners and SIM tools and things like that. So rapid workflow. Uh, rapid development of documentation in addition to the assessment and testing pieces of this. So it's not just preparation. Uh, 3PO's assessors and auditors, even for the other frameworks like PCI, HIPAA, you name it, they have the ability to go in, review the data, export that, and we can exchange information there as well, such as screenshots or supporting artifacts. Um, on the right side of the screen, I think one of the greatest things uh, about um, the Exacta tool is the ability to not only transmit um, the SSP and package to another OSCAL ready system, but if needed, export it in a FedRAMP ready SSP, which has been reviewed by the PMO um, and accepted. So we, we are using the, the very first system that's capable of doing this. Uh, so it's a critical piece of the faster solution. Um, it shaved about four weeks off of our previous process. And that, that, that's a big deal, um, especially for companies planning and trying to sell. So we'll just go over uh, some of the highlights here. Um, this is a jumpstart. It is an accelerator designed to get you ready for uh, a variety of frameworks, FedRAMP, FISMA and RMF, CMMC. State ramp. For those of you that aren't familiar, the states have established a program based on FedRAMP using the same controls, tools, processes, uh, and expectations, even three PAOs. Um, so, from a compliance perspective, any of those projects, if you're if you're working towards them, uh, this will get you there faster, and we can hit the ground running. Um, the solution uh, from a threat alert perspective, the threat alert ATO accelerator is an AWS vetted solution. It is out there in the marketplace. Um, you can go take a look, uh, as well as uh, the Exacta 360 component, OSCAL integration and automation. Um, the solution is end to end. And when we say end to end, what we're saying here is um, we discover, design, deploy, harden the environment, monitor it, support it through all of your uh, assessment activities and continuous activities thereon. Um, all the licenses are provided in a single one-stop shopping location. 
as well as the managed service components to that for continuous monitoring. Um, we appreciate our partnership with Amazon, Telos, and Splunk. Uh, each, each of those partners is very committed to this solution and we're so excited to be able to offer it. Um, you may be eligible for adoption acceleration through funding credits uh, and POC funds. Um, this is something that most folks are, uh, but sometimes there are disqualifiers. So uh, anybody interested in seeing if there's a ability to tap those funds, um, by all means, we are happy to help with that as well. So I thank you and GP, I'll turn it back over to you to answer questions uh, from our attendees and go from there. Yeah, absolutely, Martin, uh, right on cue. We like to leave uh, uh, plenty of time for questions and I can see there is a nice uh, you know, list of questions that have already popped up. So again, please feel free to uh, reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, for a limited time, we are conducting free, faster, um, uh, AT on AWS assessments, uh, do shoot us an email uh, with that subject line and we'll reach out to you and try and um, s schedule you for that assessment. So real quick, um, some of the questions. And so what I will do is um, I will farm out some of those questions, uh, Martin and Greg, uh, to, to either of you. And, you know, again, feel free to chime in. Um, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to quickly, uh, one question here is, um, and this is always uh, a big one, is how long, typically how long have you seen it take to get an ATO? So uh, Martin, if um, I may start off that question with you uh, and uh, Greg, if you have an opinion, again, it's free flowing, we want there to be a dialogue. Uh, you know, just wanted to sort of see your perspectives on that. And Martin, this is a question we always get, so um, to you. Okay, Jimmy. Um, thank you. And I might, I'll give you just a quick like 30 second history. Um, in the beginning of FedRAMP, it, it was taking 12 to 18 months, right, for an organization to um, gap assess, discover, design, develop, get it deployed, go through the assessment process that the JAB was the only organization doing it at that time. Um, a lot of things were being figured out. Um, over the next couple of years, that, that dropped back to nine to 12 months, then six to nine months. Um, and, and now we're in a state where it's, it's roughly three to six months, okay, but in most cases, nine. It's important to remember that the JAB and the FedRAMP Program Management Office allocate a 12-month time frame. They, they allow for 12 months to get through FedRAMP, and that really includes a buffer for delays, right? So from an agency perspective, they do the exact same thing. An, an agency's initial sponsorship, uh, once the process has started, is also good for 12 months. But if we look back and remember, an assessment is good for 12 months as well. So that 12-month timeline is a reoccurring theme throughout. Um, we have prepared companies in as fast as four weeks to get through FedRAMP, and, and some companies take the average of, of what is roughly uh, three to four months in terms of preparation. Uh, there, there's a lot of aspects that go into this. There's the preparation of the environment. Um, there's a period of performance, which is roughly 60 to 90 days, depending on the, the assessor and agency. So you've kind of got three months and three months, that's six months. Um, if you tack on the audit itself, once it begins with a 3PAO, it's, it's an average of eight to 12 weeks. Uh, which includes that kind of program management office, but that's assuming no delays and everything goes perfect. So what we've seen over the last two years that I can tell you, um, it is between six and 12 months, uh, I'm sorry, six and nine months with nine months being um, the traditional timeline. Three months to prepare, three months to uh, continuously monitor and roughly three months to audit. Thank you. Thank you for that, Martin. Yes, I think that's a good question. And, you know, it's very important. And I know uh, there are different, you know, data points available within the marketplace. But I think, you know, having an overall understanding of the different steps is important. Greg, I want to make sure that we get your perspective in as well. If uh, you want to add something or if there's something else that you've seen, again, you've done this for a long time. And I'm sure 
you will see a lot of customers and you know probably the same set of questions any anything to add from your perspective sir uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so right now, the way we do actually track, we use uh, metrics off the FedRAMP marketplace. And right now we're seeing about an eight month average to achieve an agency um, ATO, FedRAMP moderate agency ATO. Uh, one of the things that I really talk to customers about is, um, and, and one of the pain points I see with customers, quite frankly, is generally our customers focus on either the technical implementations and get heavily focused on that, and maybe don't focus quite as much on the documentation and the authorization package that you ultimately have to submit or vice versa. Um, and the reason it's, it's I, I sort of belabor this point when I do talk to customers is that documentation gets overlooked a lot. Okay, as long as we implement the technical security where we know our workload is secure, um, we're meeting the requirements. But if you haven't adequately articulated that in your documentation with the correct level of detail, you could find yourself in a holding pattern. Uh, pattern. Either your um, assessor is going to come in, look at the documentation and feel it's inadequate and begin asking questions, wanting more evidence, wanting, um, you know, kind of pulling on threads, or you're going to submit it to your authorizing official and then you're going to have to be, you're going to have to start answering their questions. Um, so it's just important that customers focus on both aspects, both the documentation, because the documentation is, you know, uh, extremely lengthy. Um, it is not something you can, it, it, that can be an afterthought. It's something you have to consider as you're building your solution, making sure you're documenting how you're meeting each of the controls and doing so with a sufficient level of detail. Um, but again, when customers uh, struggle to meet their techno technical perspective, ensuring they're meeting all their requirements from a technical perspective, that's really when I push um, or recommend to customers that they work with a, with a partner like Stack Armor. Um, as Stack Armor uh, demonstrated today, they can really accelerate this. And I, and I know a lot of customers say, well, you know, we have, we have technical resources in-house. We don't need to you know, offload this to a third party. Um, and pay a fee for that. Um, I'd argue that the amount of time it takes for um, both technical and non-technical resources that are not super familiar with the processes, the FedRAMP process, the DOD process, the amount of time effort um, it takes for them to get caught up, to get to the point where they are comfortable. The costs associated with that easily offset the cost you would face if you worked with an expert partner like Stack Armor. Now, that's not just me sitting here giving a commercial, I mean that wholeheartedly. We routinely see customers avoid working with partners, avoid working with third parties, expecting that they can handle it in-house only to get six months down the path and realize that they can't. They have too many questions, there's too many intricate details um, that they're unfamiliar with. So it becomes sort of a back and forth of asking questions, answering, um, and this ends up taking even longer. So we have those horror stories of, of customers ultimately taking 12 months or longer to get through the FedRAMP process. So again, um, I guess the takeaway from what I just said is eight months on average is what we're seeing for a FedRAMP moderate agency ATO. Um, that can be, you know, obviously it can go much longer than eight months um, if the customer isn't prepared, but it could also be shorter, particularly if you're working with partners that specialize in accelerating these processes. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for that fairly um, elaborate answer. And, you know, again, I know you're on many of these calls and you know, you're know you sort of the first line of, I guess, response on a lot of ATO questions. So just moving along, uh, we have a lot of questions more than I can handle. Um, uh, Martin, I'm probably gonna direct this to you. Um, I know this is uh, focused on FedRAMP, but the question I have here is, um, do you and how uh, support CMMC uh, compliance? And so I know there is, uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, uh, news around CMMC 2.0. And of course we've been supporting CMMC and its sort of predecessor or you know, actually the current law, the DFAR 7012 guidance. So uh, I'll, I'll probably start off with you, Martin, uh, on, you know, uh, on CMMC. Okay. Um, so you know, when we talk about CMMC, I, I, I like to think of uh, controlled unclassified information, the NIST 800-171 um, publications basically fixed, right? Um, and from that aspect, you know, when Stack Armor was established, um, 
800-171, ITARs, DFARs, and, and CUI was the foundation of the initial services we started offering. Uh, so for us, that's a core service. Um, a couple of things that we offer is developing not only package support for CMMC from an advisory perspective, um, we are a registered provider organization or RPO. Uh, secondarily, we have secure office solutions that are designed to say, okay, you're a company, you want to get into CMMC, which has evolved lately, by the way, from five levels to three levels, and they've sort of simplified auditing expectations. But that being said, um, we have a secure office solution that allows you to isolate CUI, federal contract data, um, in addition to uh, uh, technical information in a secure environment, um, kind of like the boundaries that we've designed for FedRAMP. Um, but this secure office does um, basically offer uh, and leverage FedRAMP uh, authorized components, uh, even though FedRAMP is not a requirement for CMMC. So we offer the same type of advisory uh, from a package development perspective, in other words, policies, plans, procedures. And then we also uh, can build out landing zones designed just for CMMC that include uh, virtual desktop interfaces, Office 365, uh, documentation repositories. Um, this is separate from FASTER and it's separate from FedRAMP, but uh, we do have a, a number of options for that. Gotcha. Thank you for that, Martin. Uh, moving along, we are getting questions at a FASTER clip that I can't probably um, get them to you. But you know, one question I have here is, um, at what stage in the assessment process is the FedRAMP level determined? And what's the criteria that is applied in the determination? And so I think when they talk about level, I think they're talking about the information risk categorization, I think that you covered in your slides, Martin. So do you wanna maybe talk about that a little bit? Um, it cut out on me, can you say the last part again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think the question is at what stage in the assessment process is the FedRAMP level determined? Oh. Um, and what is the criteria applied to determine the level? Yeah, so when we talk about risk level, um, I'm gonna simplify a little bit because there, there's actually a variety of levels, but we'll just use the, the basic FedRAMP low, moderate, high. Um, from a low perspective, you can think of those public facing environments that don't have forms, that don't collect any sort of customer data. Um, and, and an example of that might be, uh, you know, an informational site that's thrown up. And if that site is attacked, defaced, hacked or whatever, um, we blow it away, relaunch it, fix whatever the vulnerability was, and, and nobody really bats an eye. Right. Did it happen? Sure. It's unfortunate. It, it does happen. But that that's kind of that low risk category. But the, the, the key thing there is that it's not collecting or storing any sort of data. Right. Um, when we jump up to uh, moderate, right, um, that moderate risk data in the sense that could cause or bring harm to an agency or the individuals accessing the system um, or other folks. Now, it, it, when we talk about high, the traditional measurement there is financial, law enforcement, PHI, uh, patient healthcare information, or personally identifiable. Um, or information that is, is sensitive enough to the point that we want to eliminate as much human interaction as possible. Um, the high baseline is not a confidential secret, top secret. Sometimes folks see high and they think high side for those that are familiar. That's not what that is. Um, there are DOD baselines for confidential and secret type environments. Uh, but when we compare moderate to high, um, there, there's a reason that roughly 80% of the systems out there are moderate. Uh, the high baseline isn't just extremely difficult, it's also difficult to get an agency to sponsor it. So to kind of come back to your question, when does it happen? It, it really needs to happen at the beginning. Um, in many cases, customers will attempt to either jump in at the high level or low level and they really belong moderate. Well, it, it, it gets flushed out when we understand the purpose of the system and the type of data that's going to reside within the system. So agencies will traditionally, especially sponsoring agencies, come in and tell you, we want this to be a moderate or we want this to be a high. Um, 
there is a common perception. If I go high, I can support anything. Well, you've also got to have an agency willing to sponsor you for high, right? Uh, and that's not always achievable. But the moderate systems that exist today, um, that selection is, is basically uh, determined and evaluated uh, through a document we call a FIPS 199, which is a risk categorization, where we go through all the different data types and we say, okay, is this a low risk, moderate, or high risk? Um, we could have uh, from a confidentiality, integrity, and availability perspective, confidentiality and, and, and uh, integrity could be a low, but if availability is a moderate, then the system's a moderate, right? Um, it's the highest watermark. And, and if, if, if the other two were low and availability was a high, then the system becomes a high. So there, there's a lot of factors. It's not that simple of a question to answer, but hopefully that helped. Yeah, Martin, again, thank you again. There are so many different nuances and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just looking at the time and I can't believe it. The, the hour has gone by incredibly quickly. And, you know, of course, when you're having fun, that does happen. So, I, you know, I have a lot more questions that I can probably answer, but I'll try and just squeeze one in here and that'll probably be the final question. And we'll try and get written answers to those folks that uh, we've not been able to get to on this podcast. But one question I think that's interesting, Martin, is, and I'll paraphrase here, is um, the question is, uh, you know, uh, again, let me try and see if I can get the question. So uh, can you point out to the difference between a FedRAMP ATO versus a, a government agency using the FedRAMP package but providing their own ATO without having to go to the FedRAMP PMO. And oh. I think the nuance there is maybe, you know, and I, again, I don't want to, you know, steal your thunder, but I think the nuance there is, a, you know, a FedRAMP PATO versus, I guess, a FISMA ATO, but using the FedRAMP, uh, you know, security assessment framework. But anyway, I'll let you sort of uh, speak to it. Um, actually, that's not that difficult to answer. So, so here's the thing. Um, the, the, the measure, the, there, there's a couple different measurements. One is private versus public, right? Cause, cause there, there are, there are actually four, four ways to do it. Um, public, private, government community, or a hybrid of the other three. But when you talk about FISMA systems that are done in a FedRAMP like manner, um, one of the, one of the key things is the word commercial. Okay. A commercial cloud being sold to federal agencies, hosting, storing, processing, and transmitting federal data must be uh, FedRAMP, okay? Um, the, the situation you just described where an agency didn't go through the PMO, didn't go through FedRAMP, um, if, if that's how it went, that means that that is not a commercial cloud, that is a federal cloud that is owned, operated, and maintained by the federal government. The way uh, the FedRAMP program is designed um, and, and this is in revision, but, but the way it's written is that commercial clouds must go through FedRAMP. Now, I know that's probably got some folks in the audience going, wait a minute, what? Uh, but if it's in Amazon, isn't it commercial? No, not, not if it's owned, operated, and maintained by the federal government. Now, can they contract it out? Sure. But if it belongs to them and it was designed, built, and specifically created for them, it does not have to go through FedRAMP. It doesn't mean they can't decide to do it later or won't, but when typically the situation you described where the agency owns the ATO and they own the system, it won't go through the PMO. It'll never be in the marketplace um, because it's not a commercial cloud and hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Again, uh, we are at the, at the hour and I wanna make sure we respect people's time. Uh, Greg, again, really, really appreciate your participation in this webinar and again, uh, for your continued support of the program. Um, and you know, driving a lot of the engagement around uh, ATU acceleration through the program. Uh, I would just, again, thank you for our wonderful audience. Uh, again, my apologies for not being able to get to some of the questions. We just had more um, than we could handle, but we'll try and get you the responses. I know there are always questions on the slides and the content. And so uh, as my colleague Amreen, uh, our web coordinator, uh, webinar coordinator mentioned, we will make the uh, recording of this presentation available on our website. 
um, just give us a little time to get it edited and cleaned up and you know formatted in a way that it gets uh, gets there. So please do stay tuned. Um, in case you are a ISV or organization that's pursuing either a FedRAMP, FISMA, or CMMC compliance project in 2022, uh, do give us a shout and give us an opportunity to share more with you and see if we can help um, accelerate your program for uh, this kind of a compliance. Again, we appreciate your participation. I hope everybody stays safe and has a wonderful day ahead and week. Again, Greg and Martin, thank you very much. Thanks, GB. Thank you.